But this woman, 20 minutes after she arrived in Rostov, Liana, she came to Rostov 20 minutes later, she says, uh, Rabbi, I'm alone in this world. My, I was an orphan at age seven, no children, no family. My entire life has been my apartment. In Russia, there's a, you know, the, the Zhilio, Zhilio is an apartment, that's people live for that. You know, they, they, people that aren't leaving a war zone, it's because they have an apartment. She says, my whole life is my apartment. Uh, but I know I'm never going back to Mariupol. Here are the keys. Please take these keys. And if you ever have an opportunity of giving this to another Jew or helping someone out with what's in my house, every nail in the wall I bought and I nailed in myself. I have good food there that could last for another year. Anything that's there, please take this. And I'm looking at this woman who just lost her entire life. 70 years, she lost everything. And what's she thinking about? How can I help another person? Welcome back to another episode of Inspiration from the Nation. My name is Yaakov Langer. And if you are fascinated by this idea of shluchim, people being sent out, Jewish people being sent out to the most remote, random areas in the world, everywhere and anywhere, to help the Jewish community there, help the community there, this is an episode for you. I sat down with Rabbi Chaim Danziker, known as the Rostov Rabbi, famous on LinkedIn, famous on social media. He is by far one of the best storytellers that I've ever met. He talks about why he moved to Russia, his experiences there, and the incredible people he has met. And he shed some tears, I shed some tears. This episode is in memory of Shimon David ben Yaakov Shleima, as well as Miriam Sarabas Yaakov Moshe. And also in this episode, you will hear about the giveaway of a lifetime, the dream raffle, where you can win an apartment in Israel. Now, here's my conversation with the Rostov Rabbi. I'm Yaakov Langer, and you're listening to Inspiration for the Nation. We are here today with Rav Chaim Danziger, all the way from Russia. Choroshov. I don't even know. We were debating if we're going to do this in Russian or not. So what did we decide? It's uh, a Russian interview? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. Wanna, yeah, yeah. Спасибо. Хорошо. Договорились. Oh, да, да, <laughs> да. Okay, that's it. I use that's, that's right. Okay, I use that all my words. English. You probably get that a lot with um, people. Yeah. Okay, but you're not from Russia, correct? I'm not from Russia. So no. where are you originally from? Okay, so I'm from Canada. Okay. I grew up in Toronto mm. and uh, went to Yeshiva in Ottawa, then continued to London, to Israel. And somehow found my way living in Russia already. Now it's uh, 14 years, coming on 14 years. Are you married to like a Russian? My wife's from uh, Pittsburgh. Okay. Uh, from the States. I'm from Canada. Um, and we, so, so it's an interesting story how we ended, ended up there. I went there as a, before I was married, as when I was 18 years old. A roommate of mine in yeshiva in Israel convinced me to come for a summer camp. I didn't want to go. I wasn't looking to go, but he convinced me in various interesting ways. And I found myself... I, I landed, it was uh, August 2000, and, sorry, 1998, and I'm going in a car driving to this camp, this overnight camp, and about six hours into the drive, um, I ask this friend of mine, his name is Ellie, I ask him, tell me, are we going to have any meals, any food, it's six hours, Jews have to eat every few hours, so he says, yeah, we have, an, and he pulls out from his car, uh, we're in this van, he pulls out the three items, staple items of food that I'm never going to forget. The first one was matzah, it was 1998, so the matzah had big block letters, 1994, on the box. Hmm. Um, and there's no like wrapper, you know, you open the box and it's right there. <laughs> the other item was some some cracker that just wasn't successful. You know, sometimes Pashkis or whoever, you know, they make, they make crackers. Maybe they made the wrong recipe, too much pepper, too little salt, something didn't work out, and it didn't sell. So they wait till, you know, uh, not to say anything bad about Pashkis, home, right? But whichever company, right, so it reaches the expert date and what did they do they okay we're not gonna throw it out we'll send it there send it to, to, to russia to ukraine so they sent it that was the other the other item the third item was uh manashevitz gefilte fish the one in the jar oh okay so uh, but he says we don't have enough for everyone so half of you will get the gefilte fish another half of the counselors they get the jelly in the gefilte fish so uh, yeah, i mean I, I wouldn't touch either of them but that, that's what we had for 24 hours and when we, when we first came to russia uh that was in 1998. you're like i'm gonna stay here for the rest of my life and, and i just fell in love with the gefilte fish <laughs> you know this is just phenomenal in russian i just recently saw a TikTok of like a non-jew eating the gefilte fish in a jar and he like I thought he was gonna, he was obsessed with it. So that's a funny thing. I think I think everyone thinks we love that stuff. Right. So they're like, and what ends up happening? They're probably the ones buying it. Right. So it's uh, <laughs> so no. The truth is uh, interesting. Note that in Russia, one of the so imagine seventy years of communism, Jews couldn't practice. They lost 
touch with a lot of the traditions. What was one of the things that remained in Jewish people's homes? Something that the communists couldn't get rid of. What was it? It was Jewish kitchen, Jewish mm. food. So one of the foods, you know, uh, gefilte fish, it's called in Russian, farshirova nayariba, that's a staple item. Any Jew in Russia, one thing they know, if it's a grandmother or babushka, as they're called, they know how to make gefilte fish. And not to speak down to any of our uh, dear American mothers, grandmothers, their gefilte fish is better. Interesting. It's um, it, it's so interesting you say that because I feel like gefilte fish in America is like it's it's not gone, but it's not as popular as it was when at least when I was growing up. Like, what's gefilte fish for you when you say gefilte fish? It's the frozen roll. What what's what's no? Gefilte? It's it's like the white one, soggy with a carrot. Crane, okay, crane so their gefilte fish means, what's it mean? It means they actually, t- they take a full fish, cut it open, take out all the, all the meat, you know, and they grind it up and put it back in the same fish and they bake it in the fish skin and then you cut it off like pieces. It's like a different experience. Tastes different, looks different. Um, but and, and to this day, there's like certain staple foods in Russia that, uh, that, uh, that, that if you're Jewish, that's, you know, you have it at home. Your parents know how to make it. So, I don't know how we got into food. Yeah, right? I'm not sure, but bring yes, me- if I'm getting out of here, we're talking about <laughs> gefilte fish. Bring me back to, okay, so you're, you're in the camp for the year. And so, so for the summer, so. For the summer, sorry. So I showed up at camp, I'm 18 years old. And again, I didn't want to be there. I wanted to be in California. This friend of mine convinced me to go. And um, when we arrived, they give us, you know, where we meet the kids, beautiful. I don't speak a word of Russian, a little technical problem. So I, I was given like a little like a uh, uh, piece of paper that had like the basic words. It says, good morning, good afternoon. So, you know, I tell the kid five times good morning. He thinks you're a little off. Right, right. What's going on? I look for some new words. Uh, but it was an, an amazing experience. It was just unbelievable. They forgot to tell us we couldn't drink from the tap water. It was like a, a campsite in the mountains. The water wasn't the best. So like the second day of camp, we had like, I think 17 out of 22 staff members were in the infirmary trying to like oh, get gosh. over the, 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 you know, the water. Um, they gave was, them gefilte fish. They, they gave gefilte fish water. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that was the medicine. Um, what really caught my attention so I'm 18 years old. Now, I, to go back a little bit, I, I wasn't planning on becoming a rabbi. I wasn't planning on going on shluchas. When I was uh, 14, 15, I was in yeshiva in Ottawa. I was playing hockey. You know, at oh, wow. night, you know, we have lights out 9, 30, 10 p.m. Um, I was lucky enough in this yeshiva that they gave me a room with a fire escape. And come 10 p.m., 10, 30, the dorm council make sure everyone, everyone's in the room. And we would just go out the back door and we'd go to the rink. We'd play some hockey. So it wasn't my plan to go and be in Russia, to say the least. Um, so I came, so I came, so I'm in this camp a week into camp, and a boy comes up to me in my bunk. I remember his name to this day, Dima, and he says, uh, Chaim, so that I understood, Yachachu, I want a brisanya, I want to do a bris. And I look at this kid, I'm like, this is a 14 year old kid, what's he talking about? So I uh, threw him a basketball, and he went away. And uh, then he came back like an hour or two later. He says, Chaim, I want to do a... Br-. Came, a- again, I didn't know what... So I had some Twizzlers. They told me to bring candy from America. Good candy. People, kids love it. So I gave him some Twizzlers. And I, again, I held him off a little bit. That night we had a staff meeting. I say, Ellie, we have a problem. This kid wants to wants to do a breast. I don't know. He's 14 years old. I don't know what's what's going on. He says, don't, no problem. The last day of camp, a mohel comes to camp. And, uh, and I was like, what's even Really? The camp? And, and sure enough, the last day, the day before camp is over. So you, here, what, you have a grand trip before camp is over? There, okay. at a mole. These kids came to camp not knowing who Moshe Rabbeinu was. They came to camp not knowing where Rosh Hashanah is. They knew nothing. Matzah, Pesach. Suddenly, something awakened within them, and they wanted to, to, to do a bris. They, they felt they wanted to be Jewish. They wanted to feel Jewish. All their mothers were Jewish, right? So, um, so... The Moel comes. They tell me that I'm going to be the Sandak. And I tell the Moel, listen, I, I, I'm, I, I could hold him a little bit, but I, I don't think I could hold him the whole time. And I thought you hold, you know, the, with babies, you hold a baby for the bris. He said, no, no, you just have to hold the head. They lie down. Oh, uh, in the middle of the bris, I'm holding the head, and I'm looking at this uh, boy who's having modern-day Monsieur Snefish, modern-day self-sacrifice to, 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 to become part of the Jewish nation, to have a, to have a, a bris. And next thing I know, I blanked out. I just fainted. Oh, wow. They woke me up. It was too much for me. Um, and then the day, three kids in my bunk did a bris that summer. Camp was over. They all went back to these towns and villages that had no rabbis, no Jewish infrastructure, no shul, no school. And I couldn't get back to myself. I came back to Canada after camp. And I'm just thinking, like, what, what, what's with Dima, David? What's with Ruslan? 
with Reuven, another boy did a bris. What's with uh, another boy, Anton, that took the name Tzemach? And I just, you know, those are the calling card days. Remember those? When you'd have calling cards to yes, call international. Yes, yes, so, yes. so we'd buy so Some people still have calling cards. I don't know. Why. Uh, thank God it's not that expensive anymore. Right, okay. It was like buying this $20 calling card and uh, dialing. And finally, the, 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 you know, the, the, the mother picks up and the kid is, you know, these campers of mine, they're playing in the courtyard. Yeah, let me call him. Little does you know, every minute is a buck, is a dollar 48 cents, you know. <laughs> he comes up pretty much the last two minutes. I'm like, hey, Tzema, how are you doing? What's going on? There's a few, a few words. And then it dies. And I have to start this whole mm. process again. Uh, but it just changed me to the core. I saw, I saw, I, I witnessed uh, Jewish children that are willing to sacrifice something to be a Jew, are willing to do something serious. And that just caught, caught me by surprise. And I was like, you know, this is, I, I had a passion. And, and just year after year, I'd go back to this camp, second year, a third year, then I said, you know what? This isn't good enough. I'm like, why are American kids getting the most amazing camping experience, right? Their parents could afford a good camp. They spent lots of money, send the kids off to camp. And I'm, I'm, I'm and we're coming to this camp where like, you know, thank, the kids are enjoying it, but it's not quite the level. So then I said, no, we have to make a camp that's gonna take things to the next level. And that summer, I, that, that year, I recruited the best staff, you know, the staff that all the Chabad camps in the States are trying to get. I recruited these staff to come and like, we, we, we didn't even pay tickets. We were like, you have to fundraise for your own ticket, but we got these guys to come and it was just the most amazing experience. And, and year after year, I knew this is where we're gonna end up and this is what I wanna, what I wanna do in life. Okay, so when you met your wife or told your wife, like, hey, Russia is my destination, was she like, oh, I also love Russia? No, actually, um, I can't say that that she convinced me to move. Uh, we we so we were dating, shidduch, everything's going well. We're about to get engaged, and then my wife's like, by the way, you don't want to move to Russia, do you? I said, why are you asking? Interesting question. She says, because if you do, uh, I'm out. So so tell me. So that was. Um, I guess one of the, the so I, I'm thinking what do I answer? I have to give a quick answer. So I have to choose between you know moving to a place that meant a lot to me, or so I said no, we won't move, and uh, and we got engaged, Mazel Tov, and uh, we got married in uh, Pittsburgh, and we lived in Crown Heights for some time, and then we wanted to go out. Our our you know our, the life dream of a Chabad couple is to go be shluchim of the Rebbe, to go move somewhere where we could impact, where we could help people, where we could learn from people. Um, but I knew Russia was off the map, so what's the next best thing? The next best thing is, what do you think? Uh, if, if you can't go to Russia, like where would you move? I'm a New York boy, so I would say New York. New York. Okay, so the the next thing. best thing is California. Oh, wow. Okay. Right? So, <laughs> Not Russia, California. No, nice. I like no. That. Uh, so uh, we uh, moved out to, to, to California. We're working under uh, the head shulchan of uh, city Pasadena, just outside of L.A. And uh, we lived there for a couple of years. And uh, things were, were nice and beautiful, you know, San Gabriel Valley, not far from the ocean, not far from kosher restaurants, you know, it's just, just close enough to LA that you're close enough for everything, you know, all the kosher restaurants, the kosher scene, everything you need, but you're also not too close, so you also have your, you know, quiet time. And, mm -hmm. um, and we were there two years, and eventually we, eventually we somehow ended up in Russia. How? How? <laughs> yeah. Um, so what happened was, so I, 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 we were there, the community is a lovely community, um, the 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 shul everyone, but it just I always felt in the back of my you know we 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 you know how there, there's cities in Russia that don't have rabbis you know we're not talking about having competition between shuls you know California California every three blocks there's another shul another synagogue another temple another and they're all between you know Chabad this that and then you have places in Russia imagine where there is no competition there is no sh shuls out there's well, there's if you're lucky you have one rabbi and one shul if not you don't have any. And there's Jews there that, that want to reconnect. The Jews of Russia, the Russian Jews are, are warm Jews. They're Jews that are looking to always go out of their comfort zone. They're looking to go higher. And um, so one day I get a call and um, um, I was talking to the chief rabbi of Russia and I was being offered to move to a city that's called Rostov. Now, usually I wouldn't even consider there wasn't what to talk about. You know, my wife didn't want to move. When I hear the name Rostov, it resonated. That's, that's like not just being offered to move to, to any city. Because 100 years ago, 1915, the fifth Lubavitch Rebbe moved from Lubavitch, the village of Lubavitch, to Rostov. Rostov became the capital of Chabad. So here I'm being offered to become the shliach, the Rebbe's emissary in a city that was once the capital of Chabad. It's like being offered today to, you know, to be the chief rabbi of, uh, of uh, New York, of Crown Heights, wow. right? So it was very meaningful. 
Uh, I also know a little bit of the history of the city. Unfortunately, actually, it's, it's, it's interesting we're having this uh, meeting today because tomorrow is a very sad day for Rostov because tomorrow is exactly 80 years to the day by the Hebrew date that the worst massacre of Jews during the Holocaust took place in Russia. Wow. It happened in 1942. Um, when the Nazis occupied Rostov. They occupied Rostov one time, and they were fought off. They, they just occupied for six days, and they, 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 were basically, they, def- they were defeated, and they left. Then they came back a second time in 1942 in July, and within a few weeks, what was their first order for the day was to annihilate the Jewish community. They put up signs all over town, and they said Jews must gather at uh, uh, six different gathering points so that they could be evacuated to safety, right? They said safety. Uh, Jews were to bring their, all the Jews that said they have to bring their valuables, keys to their apartments, and the Jews gathered. They gathered to these six different gathering points from where they were taken to the outskirts of town. Today it's already in the middle of town, to a place known as Snakes Valley, Zmiovskaya Balkam, and they were shot dead. Oh Elderly, young people. So, so the entire community, 27,000 Jews. This is in 1942. This is known as like the Babiar of Russia. Everyone speaks about Kiev, Babiar, but this happened in Russia and this was a horrible tragedy. And here I'm being offered to come to this city and to have the merit of, of, of working with the local Yidin, uh, learning from the local Yidin. So I spoke to my wife and I was like, hey, what do you think? We had a long conversation. After the conversation, we kind of came to an agreement. I said, listen, I know you don't want to move there, but would you consider going there for two days? And then from there, we'll continue to Israel on a paid vacation. You know, they'll arrange for us a ticket. We go from California to Israel, the stop over in Rostov. And she agreed. Hmm. So it was meant to be, it was actually funny. Hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> Sorry, we here for the next hundred years. <laughs> That's, that's we, I was funny. We landed in Rostov. It's 2008. So it's August, right? This is uh, 14 years uh, pretty much of the day. And uh, there was a little misunderstanding. The head of the community that came to meet us at the airport didn't get the memo that we're here for two days. So they come, and their first question was like, why do you have so little baggage? And we're like, what do you mean, we have two suitcases? It was me and my wife at the point at the time. I had a two-year-old son. I'm like, why so little? I said, what do you mean, two suitcases, two, two pulleys? I mean, what? he said the previous rabbis that, that were here a long time, they, they had a lot more. I said, uh, my wife looks at me, she's like, Chaim, what's he talking about? Uh, like, uh, he didn't get it. I said, we're here for two days. He said, no, 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 what do you mean? The high holidays are, are, are a few weeks away. So I said, no, 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 this is just, we're here to check it out. Well, so this was um, Thursday. Friday night, I come to Shul. Our Shul is 150 years old. It's a Shul that was built by Cantonists. You know who the Cantonists are? No, no clue. Okay, so go back about 200 years. Uh, I think it was Tsar Nikolai the First that um, uh, that came up with an idea how, you know, you want to assimilate the Jews, what's the best way to do it? So one way is to oppress, another way is to actually include them and to let them assimilate into the ranks of society. So he came out with an edict, I guess you could say. Uh, it was called Cantonists. What would they do? They'd come to a Jewish shtetl. It wasn't only for Jews, but there was a, a big quota for Jews. They'd come to a shtetl. They'd tell the rabbi, tomorrow we're coming, we're taking 30 kids or 40 kids between the ages of 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. The rabbi that night would have to choose which 30 kids would be taken to the Tsar's army they, they, they'd, be, they'd be re-educated, as they called it. So till the age of 18, they'd have to go through a non-Jewish uh, learning system. The idea was to have them leave Jewish, the Jewish path. And at age 18, they began a 25-year mandatory service in the Tsar's army. So imagine at age 43, they finished their service. They're like assimilated. You right, know, right. There's amazing heroic stories of these uh, children and how they remain Jewish despite being they were taken away their parents never saw them again because back in the day they were taken thousands of miles away from their homes and that was it the they, mother was they like, didn't have a calling card no they, right. they didn't not even for 157 right. or 147 right. so um, so these Jews when they came back to Rostov Rostov was a big Jewish city that had 13 shuls but these Jews they came back they felt like they weren't welcome in other shuls they built our shul so I'm in this shul uh, actually this again this month is 150 years since the day it was built and I come into the shul on a Friday night with my wife and my son. Uh, we daven, beautiful davening. Um, no one would hire me as a chazan for my voice, but it was a nice uh, nice davening. After davening, we had kiddush, and then uh, challah, and then I say, bring out the food. And they said, oh, we don't really, uh, you know, we don't do a big kiddush. I said, why not? They said, oh, I realized those finances. I said, okay. I assumed that if they don't have a kiddush, the you know the oilam is gonna leave within a few minutes. I mean you know the way it works here. If you mm-hmm. have a good chalent, a good keshke, yeah. you'll keep the if not. 
But that's when I learned for the first time that Russian Jews don't come to shul on Shabbos for the Kiddush. Hmm. They come on, to shul. Why do they come to shul? To daven to Hashem. And they come to shul to connect with their roots, to connect to one another. They sat there. They sat for a half an hour, for an hour, for two hours asking questions. It was beautiful. I, was, I, was, I just felt like, wow, this is what I was missing. This is, you know, this thirst for Yiddishkeit, this thirst for knowledge, this thirst of, of people that want to learn what it means and how to live a Jewish life. So it was a beautiful Shabbos. Shabbos was over. We went to Israel. After it, so we got back, came back to, uh, to uh, California. And I'm waiting for this clincher, you know, this conversation to figure out where things are going. My wife wasn't really mentioning much. Hmm. Uh, so I told her, what did you think of the trip? She said, oh, I loved it. It was so nice being in Yerushalayim again. It's because we went to, to Israel, right, right? Right, right. So, so I said, anything else? She said, thank you for convincing me to go to Hebron. You know, I was worried it was so <laughs> dangerous. So I said, anything else? She, then she looked at it. She's like, yeah, I realized that we're more needed there. Let's, let's make the move. So wow. we, we, 2008, August, we pretty much, or September, maybe, we, we sold, we made a, you know, we put a, a, an ad on Craigslist. We sold everything we had in our apartment in California. Drew the last remaining suitcases, we put in our suitcase, we drove cross country. And uh, sold our car on the East Coast in Pittsburgh, and uh, moved there. So it's been uh, it's been 14 years that uh, that we've been out there, and it's been a very meaningful 14 years. Um, you know, when I when I when we first moved out, you can imagine we got a little. Uh, I guess our our parents and family weren't too fond. I mean, it's one thing to fly from California to Pittsburgh to Toronto. It's another thing to fly from Russia. Um, hmm. So I think my mother in law asked me. She she's like, you know, why are you do? Why are you taking my daughter? Why are you going there? You know, what's it's far? And and I said, no, we're, we're going there to inspire. We're going there to help the local Jews. We're going there to teach them. And what I could tell you today, fourteen years later, is that we're not inspiring them. Um, I don't know if we're even teaching them. I think we're we're being inspired by them. Mm. We're learning from them, because the 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 amount of self sacrifice, the amount of willingness to go out of your comfort zone of doing, you know, above and beyond what I mean, what I was used to, for me is an inspiration. It's 14 years of just sitting and watching Jews of all ages, you know, just just doing some amazing things. And 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 every day, every day I meet another Jew, another family, someone else, and you hear their stories, especially the elderly people. It's just, uh, I started documenting over the past couple of years, sharing some stories on LinkedIn. Yeah, I, I see, I see, I've seen some of your stuff online. Like, some of them are remarkable. Could, could you share some incredible stories that you've seen firsthand? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I some, when, when, when COVID started, um, our, our work changed very much. So um, a lot of what we did until then, uh, you know, we were used to making big events, big programs, big um, uh, uh, holiday events, and you couldn't COVID hit. So Hanukkah, we made it, we, we decided that we wanted to do something special for Hanukkah. What, what do we want to do for Hanukkah? Uh, instead of having our concert, we usually used to have a concert to raise Jewish awareness and also to just give people Jewish pride. So we'd have like the biggest hall in town, 1,300 people, we'd fill this concert hall, we'd bring Jewish singers. We once had, we once had um, uh, Dudu Fisher, then I realized you need more Russian speaking. Yeah, I was saying, like, a, who's the Russian Yaakov <laughs> So, so um, oh, actually, I was going to say that we had Betty Friedan. Betty Friedan came as a. Okay. He, he didn't come as a singer, he came he just recently. He was there actually. Um, Wasn't as a singer? What is he? He came with a. As group. a speaker? <laughs> no, 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 he came with his shul. His shul. So, ah. uh, like I said that Rostov was the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe. The fifth right. Lubavitcher Rebbe has some of the deepest Hasidic discourses. So, in Chabad, they study in yeshivas and also some shul studies. That when they finished one of his discourses, which is a full book, his entire shul came. This is half a year ago. Literally oh, wow. 30 people or 25 people showed up. So he came and it was amazing. He came into our school and he sang uh, his hit song, Harasha. Yeah, exactly. there you go. You could work on the, the accent, by the way. The Harasha. How yeah. should I say it? Harasha. Harasha. And if you want to, Harasha. 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 That's better. Much Harasha. better. So now you have three words in Russian. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so he came. I don't even know what Harasha means. Uh, good. Good. It means good? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Good. Didn't know and, that. and I was actually very, Benny came and we did a little kind of surprise. So my my, our, my kids in school, they learned this song and they sang it at one of those, the, the concert for 1,300 people. They sang this song. 
Uh, so when Benny came to our school, I had my boys get up in line. Now, they didn't know that Benny was coming. So they got up, and they made a whole performance. They're singing his song, and suddenly he pops out there. You know, they wow. look at him. This is their star, and he was there. Then he sang it. And then we had a little contest who sang it better. <laughs> we, won't, we won't go into the, uh, <laughs> the, to the results of that little. Uh, um, so, so every year on Hanukkah, we'd make this big concert. This year, because Corona hit, we couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know what? My wife is like, let's go make something special. Let's go reach out and um, visit the homes. Let's, let's bring a concert. What, what's a concert? A concert is Jewish pride. Let's go help a thousand homes. The same amount of people, a thousand three hundred people that, that would come to a concert. Let's give out a thousand three hundred food packages for Hanukkah together with a menorah and we'll make something like special, meaningful, more personal. So it's a great idea. Uh, now, because we don't have local support. I started getting on the phones, calling. I want people to see plus seven from Russia. Not everyone's too glad to take the call. So about a week before Hanukkah, I tell my wife, listen, it's not working out the, 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 the fundraising aspect of this. Um, so instead, let's, we'll give out the menorahs. We won't give out the food packages like we want, but we'll give out menorahs, maybe some olive oil and a booklet. And my wife said something that was very meaningful to me. She said, I, um, I don't let you give out menorahs if you're not gonna give it together with food packages. And I said, what do you mean? She said, when, when you know, it was Corona, people were struggling. Uh, she says, when people are struggling, when people are having a hard time putting food on the table, you don't come tell them light candles. Right. You give them food first and foremost. So I said, what do you suggest? What do you, uh, she said, go, go, you know, you have good friends in Miami, let's, you know, go there, do what you gotta do. So I called a friend of mine in Miami, he made a big event in his backyard in Miami, got, got a bunch of tequila and, uh, and, and cigar event. Uh, neither of which we're big into in Russia. <laughs> uh, and we sat in his backyard and people, absolute strangers came and they just said, we want to partner, we want to do something, we want to give 50 food packages, 100. And while I'm there, just in shock, look at this, look at Mikam Israel that you see people that, they're not Russian, they've never been to Russia, they're never going to be there, but they just want to, so, so it was just mind blowing. Um, I flew back to Russia. I landed the first day of Hanukkah. I did a COVID test. I was clean. And I said, I'm going to visit the Jews myself. I want to join, like we have efforts, volunteers, delivering food. I want to come visit people. And I showed up to someone's house. And this guy is a 90-year-old man. At the time, he was 91. Um, and I, I give him the, fo the food packages, the menorah. And he says, thank you, thank you. He said, thank you so many times. I felt uncomfortable. I said, uh, Lev, please don't thank me. It's not from me. He said, what do you mean? I said, it's from, from Miami. It's from Jews in Miami. He says, I don't have any family in Miami. What do you mean? <laughs> I said, no, it's just Jews in Miami, and they're worried for you, and they want you to have. He said, why would they be worried? I said, because they're Jewish, and you're Jewish, and they want to make sure that you have what you need. So he looks at me, and he started crying, and he says, you know, Chaim, before I die of hunger, I'm going to die of loneliness. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you don't understand. I'm alone in this world. I have no children, no relatives. My father was uh, shot dead in 1938 for being an enemy of the state. My mother was taken to jail. It was a very difficult upbringing. I, I was in an orphan at that time, practically brought up in an orphanage. Since I have no relatives, and, and, and the biggest problem I have in life is loneliness because I, I can't go out of my apartment. He's on the fifth floor. The elevator's not working. He says, I'm just here all day and I can't, I can't leave. I can't do anything. So I'm just lonely. And, and, and you telling me that someone in Miami cares for me, for me, gives me the, the, the biggest koyach, the biggest strength. I look at this yid, unbelievable. I'm so inspired by him. Um, and that's when I decided, you know, we got to do something for these Jews. So we made a program where we, um, that day we bought like three iPads, the Chinese iPads, you know, the cheaper ones. Hmm. And we made a program where we got students to come do chesed. What are students doing? They, they go to the homes of these elderly people. I was, I, I never knew they existed. I didn't know the, the challenges and hardships they have of living alone. Imagine what it's like to be lonely. It's, 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 it's crazy. It's wild. And then also, like you said, it's like scary for someone to die alone. It's, to, to, it, 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 it's like, like the, this is two years ago when the first year of Corona. And I'm just thinking, living alone, they have no computer, no internet at home, little contact with maybe a neighbor or two. So I said, we have to do something. We started making these online visits for them. So a student comes to their house with this iPad, they have their phone, they tether it, they connect it so they have internet. Mm -hmm. And they see me, and I, like one of the, you know, we talk, we sing, and for them, one of the one of the people was like didn't understand. She thought it was a video. She didn't understand that it's actually live. Yeah. Like, they've never seen something live before, and and it's been such a beautiful program. But I want to tell you one story that happened with this Lev. So he's Lev. I I I, I, I think I saw this story online. He asked you a question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was I was wondering so if I was the same person. It. No, totally <laughs> yeah. share it. Totally. So, it's an so amazing I'm story. I'm visiting his house. 
So, so this became for me important. I come visit him all the time. It was, it was just, you know, I gain so much from being around such people. He's like your rubby. He is. He is 100%. And he's like my kid's grandfather. Like my kids, wow. my, you know, my kid's grandparents live where? In Pittsburgh and Toronto. Right. They have no grandparents. Because how do they live without family? So we adopted all these people. Like my kids have tens of grandparents right. in, in Russia. So we, I come to his house. So we, we put him on our short list. Short list is people that we're going to do anything. They're alone in this world. We'll do anything to take care of them. Anything from medicine, help, loneliness, food, any, anything they need to live a dignified uh, life, we're going to do for them. So one of the things, I visit myself as much as I can. So I'm visiting his house, and he tells me, Chaim, I have a serious question for you. Can you sit down and can we discuss it? I said, yes, I figured it was something medical. I figured he needed some medicine, Some we, we'd send doctors for him. And I figured it was something he needed from me. And this is what he asks me. So think about this. This is now, this is this year, 93-year-old man who was brought up in an unobservant home. He didn't even have a home. What's his question? He says, I'm not a religious man, but I believe. I try my best. And every day I pray twice, the Amida prayer. And he says, you know, there's all the blessings in the Amida prayer. And the hardship I have now is that my feet won't carry me anymore. I'm not able to stand. And he looks at me in my eyes and he says, Chaim, do you think God is okay if I stand up and recite the first five blessings of the Amida prayer and then I sit down to rest a little? And then I stand up again to recite the next five blessings and then I sit down to rest. And then I stand up again to recite until the end. Do you think for God this is okay that I'm doing it this way or must I stand holding on to some railings the entire time? I look at Lev Ben Michael, who passed away a month ago, I look at him in his eyes, and I see the sincerity of his question. And I, I, I didn't even have an. How could I answer such a yid, such a deep, meaningful question? I, th I thought right away, how do I daven? How do we daven? How, how often do, do we do we sit and hold the sitter and actually think about the words we're praying to Hashem? How often do we stand? And, and use a phone to daven, and then there's a little message comes in, and you slip to the message. How often do we daven by heart, not paying attention to what, we're, what words we're saying or who we're davening to? And here you have a 93-year-old man who lives a very simple life. He can't leave his apartment. He's far from being comfortable. And what is his question? His question is, can I daven? He didn't ask, can I daven sitting down? Can I daven like this where I take a break in the middle? I, I, I just started tearing. I couldn't even answer. Um, someone was with me in the room, and he right away went up. He says, I want a bracha from this, from this man. Shlomi Zayans was visiting, and he walks up, and he gave him a bracha because he said, you know, this is a holy Jew. I want a bracha. So he said, what's the answer? You know, this is a real question. I told him that you could recite the Amida prayer sitting down, and I told him, I promise you, for Hashem, your Amida prayer is leaps above any Amida prayer that I could have in standing up. He was worried. And that's, this, is, this is a Jew. This is a Jew that just wants to connect to God and wants to pray to God, but he wants to do it right. His father didn't teach him. His mother didn't teach him. He had no one to teach him. He himself, we put on tefillin, and he says, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Aleikeinu Hashem Echad. He says it by heart. And I look at the eyes of this wise man, wise man who had a difficult life. And he was always so optimistic, always so positive, always about doing good for others. I was in Israel, it was his 93rd birthday in May. I call him from Israel. I says, Chaim, thank you for calling me. You know, no one else called me today. And I'm so grateful that you remembered. And I told him, Lev, it is the biggest joy for me to be able to have this connection to you. You know, sometimes we think when it comes to kindness that, oh, we're going to help people, we're going to do good. It's not about us. You know, it's, the world stands on three legs. One of the legs is what? Gemil is chasad, doing chesed. It's not about us, how we feel. It's not about them. Hashem gave us, gave us a, a klal, gave us a mitzvah that we have to do. And, and it means that we have to do it regardless of where we are. You know, some, so, so I made this post and some, it just caught fire, right? So with, with online, um, when things got a little difficult, I guess, uh, uh, financially, and I, I, you know, I wasn't able to travel Corona. I said, you know, let me just share a little bit of what inspires me with Oilam. And I started sharing some posts and, um, you know, and, and people were res responding very positively. Wow, amazing. And, and wow, it's amazing there's such people. And... I was thinking like, wait a minute, these people exist not only in Rostov, they exist in Brooklyn. You have people here, neighbors. How often do we walk out of our home 
we see our neighbor who lost a husband, maybe he has no children, and we maybe wave, maybe we don't even wave, maybe we just, we just continue, like we're busy running, if it's our work, our own family issues that we're dealing with, and we're not thinking necessarily enough about those people around us. If, if someone came and asked me for tzedakah, Hashem sent him, it doesn't matter where I am. Right. You know, I, I, uh, I was in a shul in, in Muncie, um, and, and it's very like, modern there, you know, the whole, uh, the, 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 the machines, and you could just uh, right swipe, away, uh, swipe, uh, that's next right. level, right. next level in Zdaka. So a friend was with me, and he, he was watching, and there's the fifth guy coming, asking, and he's already, you know, a little bit, you know, fifth guy, sixth guy, how many? And I was like, this is a bracha, to be able to, like, I wish there, there was this level of chesed, in my show, where everyone knew that they just come. I mean, I mean it's, it's, it's something special to be able to be in a position of giving, it doesn't matter what, small, a dollar, fifty sense but just to, 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 to do chesed to do kindness and and what it does to us so so in relationships and doing chesed for others it's not for us we we we, we it's, it's not it's, they don't need us sorry it's not for them they don't need to receive the chesed i mean it helps them but you know how much it helps us you know you know what a mitzvah what what it does up there when there's chesed being done when there's kindness being done when there's a mitzvah a commandment being fulfilled that's what that's a, eh, we're, we're living we're davening for mashiach What's bring, what's, a mitzvah brings Mashiach. The Rambam says that the world is like you know, scales and you could tip it with one extra mitzvah. That mitzvah, chesed, is, is a mitzvah that you fulfill constantly. All day you, you're surrounded by opportunities to do chesed to someone else. I feel that there. It's, 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 it's amazing. That's really, really incredible. We'll be right back to this week's episode. But first, the opportunity of a lifetime is here. Rav Shmuel, tell us about the Dream Raffle. Hi, this is our fifth year of the Dream Raffle. And Yaakov, you've been with us for a couple of years yes, now for this it. raffle. Yes. <laughs> and it'll it'll be great. Oh, it'll make me feel great when we pull a winning name out and I ask the person, how did you hear about this raffle? Oh, I saw you on the commercial with Yaakov Langer. So that will give us great, great, great simcha, right? Someone can listen feel. to this. This is a raffle. There's a lot of raffles, but nothing like this ever has been done this and this is our fifth year so it's it's people are so excited you could win a million dollar apartment in a luxury building in the heart of Yerushalayim but wait with a view of Harabayit and not just like one of these views oh yeah you really see Harabayit in front of you incredible gorgeous building there's a gym in the building Shabbos elevators fantastic location and it's yours. It's yours forever. After 120, you could pass it down to your inheritors and so on. And all you have to do is go to thedreamraffle.com. Remember the word the, thedreamraffle.com. And you can get a ticket. And not only that, but we're offering right now two for one. So for every ticket you buy, you get two, you buy five tickets, 10, and so on. And because of your listeners, Yaakov, that's well, it. Give you a promo code LL. Nice. I don't know, right? Living LL. There we go. Living Lachayim. There it is, and you'll save ten dollars. So it's an incredible opportunity to win a million dollar apartment in Yerushalayim, and like I said, it's yours forever. Code LL takes off ten dollars, two for one. But I have to tell you, I met a guy, and he says to me, Shmuel, you should know something. Every year, I I win your raffle. I said, why? He says, because the money goes to a good cause, mm. and it's true. No, this is the only fundraiser that we do. The money is building Israel's first ever search and rescue site. Mm -hmm. right, we all heard the news. This boy, Moshe Kleinemann, is missing for already 200 days. Our guys have been searching for him since day number four. The police entered it two months later. The IDF started searching for him four months later. We have a search and rescue center that we're building in Meron. We donate Sifrei Torah to the IDF. We're helping farmers plant after Shemitah. A lot of things going on across the land, and you can support it all and win an apartment, thedreamraffle.com. And remember, code LL. It's, I just want to add that um, last year when we did this, I was like watching by the drawing, and I was so like excited for two reasons. One, it was like, okay, I hope someone on the show that you know that I, we promoted it actually wins. But also, I was hoping that I won because I'm like, oh my gosh, I just spent a few dollars to give to Tzedakah, plus I might win an apartment. I didn't end up winning, which is exactly why I'm entering again. And um, like you said, it, it truly does feel like you win no matter what because it goes to a great cause. 
and it's very exciting to be a part of the Dream Raffle. So it is, it is and, and it's it's our pleasure. It's unbelievable. You know, it, the Israeli news came to us last year. They said, "Ben, eh? really, you're giving this apartment away?" I said, "Yeah, here are the keys. Buy a ticket, and the, this is yours." So it's two for one. Code LL. Take off ten dollars. Last year we had Shlomo Katz at, at the drawing. You did your mayor. That's Sivan Rahmei's husband. It was very exciting. We're going to make it even more exciting this year. But you know what they say: you got to be in it to win. And I stole that line from the other guy. But so uh, when's, <laughs> when's the drawing? When's the drawing? The drawing is January first. Okay, but the earlier you join, we're having now bonus raffles. Exciting things are happening along the way. Buy a ticket. You can give it as a Hanukkah gift. A lot of different things. Fantastic opportunity. And again, code LL saves you $10 and for limited time, two for one. So good luck and Lashana Habab Yerushalayim. Amazing. Thank you so much, Rav Shmuel. So anyone who's watching or listening, there will be a link in the show notes. Use code LL for $10 off. And now back to this week's episode. I love that idea of like looking at chesed kindness in that way that it's so easy to assume like oh i'm for sure helping this person but like bigger picture it's like no no you don't know how much this is changing you it's 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 really it's, incredible it, it's totally not about about the the receiving end it's about just what's happening and it's not about my end because you could say I, I could tell i could make a statement and say that by you you could be the richest businessman the most successful business and you could be doing amazing business but the fulfillment and joy and meaning you'll get out of doing kindness to someone else mm -hmm. You could never receive that by any business dealings in the world. Um, but even that isn't the reason we do chesed. It's not because it makes me feel good. Right. It's because the world was created, so there should be chesed. Right. And, 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 and not, not, Baruch Hashem, Hashem made it in such a way that we receive some satisfaction from it so that it pushes us to do more. But there's just so much. You know, I had a, um, so when I'm talking about these elderly people, I had a, a woman by the name of Miriam Goldfarb. Another woman, she unfortunately passed away during COVID. She was our, one of our bubbies. And um, she was a survivor. The Nazis came in. I mean, she wasn't in a camp, but the Nazis came, occupied the city. She was in hiding. Um, and, and we'd visit her all the time. And she, she was one of the last people that spoke here. This show just so special. My kid's coming and, you know, raising her spirits, dancing in her house. She lived this, nothing. She has nothing, no relatives. And one day I get a call from her. And she, and she says, Chaim, I, uh, I need to see you right away. So I said, Miriam, I'm going to come to your house. She says, no, I'm coming to you to shul. I said, Miriam, you're 91 years old. I could come to you. She said, no, I must come to you. I'm coming. Don't worry. And she was like this elderly woman that, you know, uh, she had a bad back and she was, you know, limping. And anyway, she comes to shul and she holds on, you know, our, our shul. It's built a long time. You have to go up steps when you come in. She holds on the railing. And, and I go down to me. And she's like, no, we have to go to your office. This is important. So, okay, we walk up to my office and she tells me, Chaim, I came here today to fulfill a mitzvah that I've been dreaming of fulfilling for many years. And I'm thinking, what, what, what mitzvah? She is, only, she, is, she is a person that's only mitzvah. She only thinks of others. She has no family, so she thinks about everyone. She's calling me all the time, but this lady's sick. We help her. We, what, what mitzvah is she talking about? She opens her purse and she hands me $200 tzedakah. And I tell her, Miriam, what's going on? I know that her pension is $160 a month. She's handing me $200 stuck of her. This is a month and a half pension. She says, Chaim, I've been dreaming of this day all my life. She said, I just received restitution money from the German government in the sum of $2,000. I just withdrew the money from the bank. And I didn't even go home. I stopped here right away to fulfill the mitzvah of giving tzedakah. And here, $200, please give it to those in the community that need it most. And I'm looking at this lady. She's 91. She could use this money as well, if not better than anyone else I'll give it to. But no, she wants to do chesed. She wants to fulfill the mitzvah. She wants to help another Jew. I'm looking at her and I'm thinking, hey, when we give, when I give tzedakah, <laughs> how many times do we give it? <laughs> do you throw it? Okay, you're forcing me. She's giving it like that. She wants to do, she, she, she's dreaming of doing it. it. It's just unbelievable. It's really wild. And I'm sure we could go into tons of stories from the, the Bubbies and Zadies there. But uh, something interesting that I'd love to talk about is the camp that you have there. Could you, could you give us some background of like, what was the need and how you actually got it done? So actually this year, you know, we, we, so camp has been my passion, my wife's passion as well. Since we moved there, kids, it's the future. So our, our overnight camp, um, 
I'd say 80% of our staff are alumni. They came as children. They, uh, we, we sent them to seminaries, to yeshivas, to schools. They come back. With so, they they want to give back to the camp that gave them so much. So it's, it's just every summer when camp hits, for me, it's Gan Eden. We just sit there watching these kids that are coming. We, we, we send out cars and minibuses to all kinds of towns and villages that don't have rabbis, don't have Jewish communities. Um, and we bring these Jewish kids to us. And we know this is one chance. You have one chance, you know, assimilation rate in Russia is 90%. So if we don't get to these kids, if we don't expose them to their heritage and teach them uh, Torah, what it means to be a Jew, this is one chance. If we don't do it, we don't. So, so they come and it's, it's literally life saving. It, it, it's it's my, my campers from 1998, 99, 2000. Our rabbis today wow. in Berlin, in Kiev, in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, in Israel. It's unbelievable. So I know the impact of camp. And for me, that's always been my passion. So every year, for my, my world stops so that we could do camp properly. But this year was something special. This year, so a year ago, we got exposed for the first time to uh, children with special needs. In, in, in Russia, in that part of the world, it's not something that's so accepted. So you don't see people that are walking the streets with special needs kids. You know, Down syndrome, any type of uh, physical uh, uh, disabilities, anything, it just doesn't exist. Right, it's like more taboo. Yeah, yeah, not more, complete. Got it. So when we started, uh, when I started visiting homes, I got exp- over the past couple of years, I started getting exposed to more and more families that are living very difficult lives because quite often, uh, if there's a special needs child and it's not so accepted, quite often the husband could leave the wife. And a wife, imagine a mother's left alone, a single mother, raising special needs kids with little to no support. Wow. So they're underserved. Um, I said, we have to do something. So I, um, I got a group of our teens and I said, guys, there's a special project. I want to put you through an intensive learning experience for half a year. Every Sunday you'll come, you'll study, you'll spend some time, we'll get these kids together, you'll learn how to, how to work with these kids. And in the summer, we're going to make a camp for them. This is a dream I had, and my wife and I. And uh, came the summer, we opened the first ever camp for children with special needs in Russia. Um, I got a call from Siberia. I got a call from Siberia, a woman on the phone. She's like, um, you know, I have a seven-year-old child, um, special needs, he's in a wheelchair. Uh, can we come to your camp? So I was like going to say that, you know, our camp is for Rostov, for southern Russia, or something more for us. My wife said, what do you mean? There's a Jewish mother with a special needs child in Siberia. What difference does it make? So I said, we'll take, we'll take you, no problem. I gave the dates where camp is. It's seven hours away from Rostov. Then she calls me the next day and she said, um, unfortunately, I can't come. I looked up tickets. It's two different flights, a six-hour drive. It's way too expensive. But I just want to tell you how touched I am that you were willing to accept my child to your camp. Um, my wife hears this. She's, no, wait, where? she says, let's pay the ticket. I call her back. I said, we're, we're going to get the ticket for you. We got her the ticket. She flew with her son, this heroic woman, two flights, six-hour drive. And we got a hundred of these children with something very unique because usually special needs camps camps for special needs children what do they do they um they you take the kids so the mothers could get a little break the families we had a very different uh, perspective to this we wanted the parents to come the mothers to come along why first of all they're not going to give up their kids without them it's just never it's not accepted they, they, they can't even imagine that they're with their kids 24 7 since the day they were born there's no chance they're gonna let their kids leave their site. And they don't believe someone could take care of them. That's first of all. Second of all, the mothers have never gotten away themselves. Mm. These mothers have never gone to camp, never gone to vaca- on a vacation. They're not comfortable. You can't go out with to, 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 to the lake, to the river, to the ocean with your child that, that's different. It's just not accepted. So I, we, my wife is like, we have to get the, these mothers. They need it as much as, so, so we gathered them. And it was the most spectacular camp I've ever seen, like our camp, our, we had a regular camp, and then we had this camp. And seeing these mothers walking around camp for the first time in their life, you know, they, they, they just kept, I, I felt, we feel like they're saying, so, so grateful, thank you. I said, stop it, stop it, enjoy, you're here to enjoy, you don't need to say thank you. You know, the, the mentality in Russia is always like you have to thank, and you have to write thank you letters, and we don't want that. We want to, anything we do, we want it to be dignified. You know, when you give, when you, when you help someone, you could do it in a way that, you know, I'm helping you so that you'll, uh, you know, you need my help, or you could do it in a dignified way so the person doesn't feel that he's coming to receive something mm. and that's been the goal how do we do things dignified so we just finished this camp now a couple weeks ago and we get it, 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 what we thought was going to be an overnight camp for special needs children in Rostov turned out for the whole Russia and the last day of camp 
the mothers came to me and they said, uh, obviously a big thank you, but they said, we, we, we can't wait till next summer. We, we, there's a void and we need someone to fill this. Like we feel for the first time that we're loved, we're, we feel for the first time that we're in a group of, 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 of parents that deal, mothers that deal with the same problems, we need this to continue. And we sat down, we, we've been discussing it now since we've, we're visiting the States, we've been discussing what we need to do. We decided we're gonna open the first ever Jewish special needs organization of the whole Russia. They need support, they need help. Um, and, and if we're able to alleviate some of their challenges and burdens that the parents have and the kids, the mother said, e- even, I don't, I don't know if it's more important, but as important as the, the love our children are receiving, the fact that we're here, mm-hmm. able to get the support. We had a whole program where every hour, a few hour, a few, every day, a few hours of the day, our staff took the kids, and the mothers were just going, getting help from just you know massages and help and pedicure, manicure, whatever they wanted, but also just getting a chance to to talk to one another. We had a psychologist that were helping them. We had different types of therapists that were giving them advice. For them, it was something that they never received before. So it's it's, it's really something anything to do with camp with kids. We see such such an impact. And it's so meaningful, and and I feel like this whole, you know, we're, we're shluchim in in Rostov. We're there because the Rebbe taught us you have to go out, not necessarily to the place that is has the nicest beaches, or the nicest city, or the best weather. You have to go where you're needed, and and and, and you know what? I I, I don't envy uh, shluchim that are living in the beach towns. Why? Because it looks. You know, believe me, I lived in California. The first month or two, it's it's beautiful, and after you get used to it, it just becomes the day to day grind that you're doing, working with Eden. It's not it's not always easy. Um, working and helping people spiritually, materially, but but there's something special that kind of guides us in Russia that we we we, we never went out planning to open a special needs overnight camp. Right. We never planned to open a special. They didn't even announce it. No one even knows. You're know, the first one hearing that we're opening a special needs organization for the whole Russia that's going to help these children and their parents give, thr- uh, strive to give support throughout the year. But but we do things just somehow, Hashem puts something, I, I feel when something comes our way, there's there's a need, there's a void, um, you have a choice. You could either pay attention to it and say, it's it, it, you know, it didn't fall in my lap for nothing, or you could say, you know, no thanks. I feel that anytime we're given an opportunity to, to, to do a mitzvah, we're given an opportunity to help someone, we're given an opportunity to, to focus on someone that is in a challenging situation. It's not for nothing. Hashem did it so that we should either react or not react. Hashem wants us to react. Are we going to react or not? So yes, we have a lot going on. Yes, we have a school. We have a soup kitchen. Yes, we have a youth organization. And yes, we have a, a shul and, and, and everything. But this is something that's it, it didn't fall in our, in, you know, in our laps for nothing. We have to do something. So we'll figure out. We're now sitting down. We, we're meeting with different organizations here to get the, the plan of what needs to be done and how to properly work. But but it's, 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 it's very meaningful when when you just realize everything that comes your way is Hashem's way of saying, hey, you, you could do more. There's, there's a beautiful story about uh, Rabbi Steinzeltz that once came to the Rebbe with a problem. What was his problem? His problem was, he said he has three different projects that each one of his, I don't remember, one of them is obviously the translation of the Talmud, another one was the, the yeshiva that he opened, and a third one, I forgot what it was. And he's saying, there, it's, it's too much for me, for one man to do, and I'm asking the Rebbe, I think the question was like, I'm asking the Rebbe, what should I focus from these three things? Because each one is a full-time job, I can't do all three. And what was the Rebbe's answer? The Rebbe's answer, if I, again, I'm not uh, saying word for but the answer was, do more. Do more than three. Why only three? Do more. Hmm. What does that mean? That means that we sometimes Sometimes we think I'm only capable of doing this much and not more, but but the truth is that when we really put ourselves to it, if if something fell in in, in our direction, if something came into sight, it's a sign from Hashem that we were meant to do something, and and I feel we're 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 blessed to 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 have amazing people around us that are always. Uh, you know they're always up for the challenge, and you know it's it's not us. People always say, "Wow, I, I'm, I'm I'm even almost uncomfortable posting things because people are always saying, oh, amazing.' It's it's not about us. It's not about me, my wife. It's there's, 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 it's a team of people. It's 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 Jews there that are just inspiring us to always think of what else we could do and how could we, you know, f- for us to keep kosher is easy. But when someone was brought up in a city, I mean, when we moved, there was no kosher. When someone decided to start keeping kosher in a city that has no kosher restaurant, I mean, for us, the summer is like it's, a, it's Disneyland. You know, you go, <laughs> my kids come here, go from a pizza store, now we're going to take this takeout and this and then spicy fries. And in <laughs> Rostov, there's mommy fries. And then there's everything is, you know, homemade. <laughs> when we want pizza, it means uh, taking flour and my wife putting it together and then making the sauce at a scra- from scratch and having the Chalav Yisrael uh, cheese that I schlepped in with my suitcase 
from New York all the way there with a stopover. If the stopover was too long, then it might have melted on the way. If not, then it's going to make it all the way. So, so it's always, you know, it's always, uh, uh, it's always an opportunity to do and to to, to realize that uh, we're able to do a lot more than we think. We it, just have to put ourselves to it. Fascinating, truly fascinating. I, I want to ask you, what has your experience been like with everything going on? Uh, in today's climate with with uh, Russia. Okay. So uh, when things, in the end of February, um, I was actually visiting my son in yeshiva so that he learns in New Haven. And uh, we had a, sh- a, sh- had a Shambis Horim when the, parents, the fathers come to be with their children. Um, everyone was saying that, you know, don't worry, nothing's going to happen. I landed in New York and everything started. I told my wife, should I come back? And she said, no, listen, our, our son needs you. Stay for Shabbos and you'll come back after. Over Shabbos, everyone's convincing me, no, it's dangerous, don't leave your wife there, bring her back, bring her, bring the family till things settle down. So I called my wife Sunday and I told her, okay, maybe you should come here. And my wife says, Chaim, you can imagine, this Shabbos in Shul, we had three times the amount of people we usually have. People need direction. People need support. People need... Uh, Guidance. This is not a time for us to, to for the for us to leave the ship, and that was it. I I got a ticket back. I landed. Uh, my my airport in Rostov closed down, so I had to fly through Turkey to Moscow. Take a twenty hour train, twenty four hour train ride. I got back, and the past half a year have been challenging. Um, we've welcomed a lot of refugees. We're right on the border, right next to Mariupol. So I first got a call about a woman, a Holocaust survivor, that needed to be saved. And we met her by the border, we brought her to our uh, shul, we rented a hotel, and we real- the, the, the calls were coming in from everywhere, could you please help? Because they had an option of going in one direction, that was a 17 hour uh, tr- drive or, or traveling, that's dangerous, or it took on three hours to Rostov. Um, we ended up having hundreds of these amazing people that came over that, uh, you know, some of them came for a week, for two, for a month. Very difficult, very hard. You see what they've been through. Uh, and we just felt like, people said, you know, what what, what do you think? What I said, our job is not to think. Our job is to do. Uh, regardless on which side of the border these Yidin live in, our job is to help. And it's not only the Jews. We had non-Jews that somehow came in our direction. We just said, we have to help. People are in need. It's a sign that we have to help. Um, so we sent a lot of them wanted to go to Israel. Actually, I have an interesting story. Um, there was one amazing lady. Her name is Liana. She came to Rostov from Mariupol. And tw- she was, why am I saying this story? Because she had a unique story. Usually, these refugees that came, they obviously they came with nothing. They needed support, they needed medicine, accommodations, food, and we took care of all of that. But this woman, 20 minutes after she arrived in Rostov, Liana, she came to Rostov, 20 minutes later, she says, uh, Rabbi, I'm alone in this world. My, I was an orphan at age seven, no children, no family. My entire life has been my apartment. In Russia, there's a, you know, the, the Zhilio, Zhilio is an apartment. That's people live for that. You know, they, they, the people that aren't leaving a war zone, it's because they have an apartment. She says, my whole life is my apartment. Um, but I know I'm never going back to Mariupol. Here are the keys. Please take these keys. And if you ever have an opportunity of giving this to another Jew or helping someone out with what's in my house, every nail in the wall I bought and I nailed in myself. I have good food there that could last for another year. Anything that's there, please take this. I'm looking at this woman who just lost her entire life. 70 years, she lost everything. And what's she thinking about? How can I help another person? What can I do so that my apartment shouldn't go? My, my life's you know, earnings, everything I have should go to someone else to help another person. I was in shock. This is someone thinking about others. Now, what happened was everyone wanted to go to Israel. She came to me. She said, oh, I, can't go to, I can't handle the heat. I can't go to Israel. I need to move to Germany. So I look at this woman and I'm, Rabbi, I'm gonna send you to Germany. I felt uncomfortable, but that's what she wants. We have to help her. I called 15 communities in Germany and I said, there's a Jewish wife. I said the whole story. They all said, we'd love to help, but there's no room. We're just, we're just overwhelmed with the amount of refugees, Jewish refugees, we can't help. And she stayed by us for a month and a half. I get a call from Frankfurt and the commu- someone in the community there said, a room in the refugee hotel has freed up if she comes within three days, we could give this room to her. 
I come to Liana, I tell her, Liana, good news. And she, we celebrated her birthday by us. We made, made her feel at home. And she said, you know, I never felt this loved in my life. Our community was unbelievable, the way they accepted her. Um, she, so I told her, if you arrive within three days, you have a room. Tomorrow morning at 6 a.m., I'm getting you a car. I found the driver in the city that was able to drive her because she didn't have a passport. So she had to drive through Belarus, through Poland, all the way to Germany. So I found the right driver that had the right papers. We paid him a lot of money so that he could take her. 6 a.m., I meet her at the car, and she looks at me, and she says, Chaim, I can't go. She says, I can't go. It's, 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 it's too difficult for me. You know, here, I know you guys. I love you. You guys love me. I, 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 I just can't. I'm there with my wife at 6 a.m. We're supposed to say goodbye. Our camp is starting in two days. So I look at her, and I'm thinking, how do, how do I? I said, don't worry, Liana. Everything's... She's like, I don't know anyone there. I said, don't worry, Liana. We'll come visit you. Um, I didn't mean it. I just said it. Whatever you have to say to save right. a woman's life. So I said, I'll come visit you. She says, uh, her eyes lit up. You'll visit me? I said, of course, we'll visit you. Come on, just go. She says, you promise? I said, yes, I promise. She said, but remember, you promised you're going to come visit me. I said, yes. She sat in the car and she left. The next day I went to camp. Our camp is seven hours away from the city. It's in the mountains. There's no phone reception, no internet. The first time we went, the new campsite, no. So imagine what it's like, no phone at night. Every night I go like 15, 20 minute walk up a hill and you know, you get all your WhatsApps quickly and maybe you have enough, <laughs> enough, enough uh, cell reception to respond. Every day I see I have a missed call from Germany. Plus four nine. It's a few days into camp. Every night I come, I go, I miss call from plus four nine. Camp is over. A day later, I come back to the city. I see the call, a phone call from Germany. Oh, this is a, who is it? I pick up. Hello? Chaim, Rabbi, this. Yeah, it's Liana. She says, you promised you're going to visit me. When are you coming? I said, Liana, how are you? Yeah, amazing. But you said I need you to come visit me. So my wife said, you know what? You promised. We have to do it. Let's go. I said, now? And she said, yeah, on the way to America, we'll go. So we look up tickets. The only tickets we were able to find were through Saudi Arabia. No oh, gosh. On Saudi Arabian Airlines. So uh, a few weeks ago, uh, my wife, myself, and my son, we found ourselves in a city called Jeddah for 12 hours. We, we stayed in the, in the airport, of course. Um, but we, uh, we, we flew to Frankfurt for half a day. And we met with Liana. She prepared. We... we other than her, we sent another about 10 people to that refugee hotel over the, uh, after that or a little before. Um, she, she, she set up a whole tea in her room, fruits. She felt what it was like to be able to give. You know, the biggest, the biggest chesed you could do is to let someone else give you. Sometimes they give you and say, oh, I don't want to take. No, take. Mm -hmm. You're giving someone the opportunity to give. It's the biggest, the, 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 for them, it's the biggest. So she invited us to her room and she had fruit and take and she's filling bags and we're there for half a day. It wasn't, you know, I, I didn't plan to go to Germany. I didn't care to go to Frankfurt. But if we could make another person's life, if we could make them raise their spirits, make them besimcha, give them a lot of joy. Why? It took a half a day. It took a little expenses for a flight. This, But it changed her life. She's there and she's so happy. And, you know, why, why, why not think about what we could do, about what, what, yes, did it feel good? It did feel good to, to, to see someone in such a, in such a state after all they've been through that they're happy and they're happy to have you. But, 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 but it's, 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 it's this kind gesture that you're letting, you're, 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 you're letting them give you and you're doing something meaningful. So we just came back now. We uh, had friends in Germany, like different friends that are also from, from Ukraine, they're refugees. Like, why don't you come in? I said, no, we came for one thing just to visit Liana and some other people we sent there that we also said hello. But, um, so, so it's been the past half a year. The past half a year has been um, has been challenging in many different ways, um, but we feel that this is the time that the Jews need us most, and uh, we're there to to be to be by their side. Um, the airport's closed. A lot of products that we used to have, kosher products, might not be available. Um, but but these imagine what it's like for the elderly who have no family and they hear what's going on. This this is when they need someone to be there. So. Um, we feel we feel we're going back now on Sunday. With we're loading up on uh, challah Israel cheese and some other necessities, and uh, we're gonna do what uh, what we've been trying to do for the past fourteen years. Really beautiful. If there's one person in history that you could sit down with, who's no longer with us, who would you sit down with? You know, for a for a. Asking asking that question, Lubavitcher is come on. You, know, <laughs> you, can't, you, can't, you can't even you can't even. Uh, is that really your? Is he really your answer? No question that that you know my 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 parents are Bali Chuba. They became observant through shluchim of the Rebbe in Toronto and Ottawa. Um, so I was already you know born into into 
uh, a family of, uh, of observant Jews, but everything that my family has that I have today is thanks to the Rebbe and his vision of sending out emissaries. You know, today it's popular. In the 70s, in the 60s, it wasn't something popular to go out to towns that had no kosher, right. that had no mikvahs, to go send people there. So for me personally, the, 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 you know, I, I recently, um, one, of, uh, one of the families from that the we were zochet to, to, to bring closer to Yiddishkeit, uh, they, we did their chuppah, I was a sandak for their son, um, and we were able to help them move to Toronto to help the Jewish community, like on Shlichas. So it's kind of a full circle. Yeah. You know, like my parents uh, became from through Shluchim. We became Shluchim. And we were able to, we had the, the, the privilege of being by the side of some amazing Jews that themselves became from. And today they're kind of Shluchim in Toronto, wow. right? in Canada. That is a good so second. when you're asking about who to sit for, for a chassid to be able to be, I mean, what, what hour by the rabbi? To sit five hours by by a person that taught us what it means to have true Avas Yisrael, what it means to love another person fully and completely and to do chesed for someone else, there's no question that uh, that, that, that would be very uh, meaningful. What, what is the lesson that you think America could learn from Russia, if, if there is one? Okay, why if? Okay. <laughs> well, give me one of them. There's probably um, so many. You know, one, one of the things that, that, um, that for us as Americans was uh, very surprising. So, um, you know, there's, there's a, the hospitality that exists in Russia is something unparalleled in the world. The, 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 the orchim, you come to someone's house, you are treated like royalty. You sit down, they will feed you, they'll take care of you, they'll, you know, the, the, it, it's a di- different level. Anything to do, you know, there's a concept not to come, uh, not to come with empty hands. I invite people, they're going to always bring something, flowers, gifts. It's not acceptable to come. And uh, and once they're by you, or once you're by them, you sit for hours. The the friendship, camaraderie, um, relate the relationship you have with people is something that I didn't see anywhere else in the world. Like I could sit with community members, friends, we could sit for hours, for five hours, for seven hours, and you don't want to leave. You're just sitting, you're connecting on a deep level. How In, in, in Russia, you're not, you're, how, how are you impacting people? How are you teaching people what it means to be a Jew or how to become a better Jew? It's by sitting with them and not rushing and talking. And, you know, I remember when I was first uh, invited somewhere, we just moved there and someone invited me uh, to an out-of-town wedding. And he said, when do you want me to get your ticket for? And I was like, what do you get my ticket for? He says, I'll buy you a ticket. I was like, and, and, and he bought me a ticket and he bought me, and this is not a wealthy person. He bought me, uh, he got me a hotel. That's the way it works there. When it comes, when someone's celebrating a uh, special, they'll invite you and they'll also help you come and they'll help you with, and not because I'm a rabbi. It just, that's something that's, mean, so, so for me, that's something that even here, like now it kind of, you know, when we come visit someone to come without a bottle or without, even, even during the week, not just Shabbos, you kind of think it's not, it's not appropriate because, you know, you get, get into that mode. So there's something special about, about how to treat other people people and about being willing to take off the shirt from your back for another person just to, to make them feel at home beautiful what, what's the worst advice you've ever received um the worst advice i mean i was strongly advised to not move to rostov okay um and I, i'd say that was the worst advice i received because i living there we've received so much on so many levels and every day the inspiration we get from the Yid in there is 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 just you know out of this world that I'm thinking what would it, what 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 would it, our life look like if had we chosen to not pursue this avenue of shluchas of, of going out there and, uh, and and learning from 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 the Jews that that, that are there so I, I I think you know you have to you have to sometimes be willing to pursue. Um, you know, some dreams you have, even if they're off the charts, even if um, at first your wife isn't too fond of them. Huh. Everyone asks, well, what does your wife think today? You know, is she happy there? So every morning I give her a little schnapps uh, in the morning and then she's happy. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, where's this going? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, she's very happy. She's, she's, you know, if, if in, you know, in a Jewish family, the most important thing is um, Shalom Bais is being, you know, if my wife was not happy there, I would not be there. There's right, no question right, about right, right. it. Right. Um, even if even if she went willingly, and then at some point it became difficult, then the family first always with the wife with the children, 
Uh, but I believe my kids, you know, people uh, often ask, but, but isn't it difficult without kosher food, without, are they deprived, without, you know, relatives, without family? And, and I always say, you know, that I think what, what our children receive out of being in this position and what their, uh, you know, the people they meet and the experiences and the help that they're giving, I think it's, it's, it's for life. You can't get this anywhere else. You know, the, the, I think one of the lessons that the Rebbe gave through the Shluchas institution is that the best way to help yourself is to help others. If you want to rise, how do you rise? You could work on yourself, on, on rising. I'm saying spiritually. I'm not talking about becoming a person of influence. I'm talking about spiritually. The best way to, to, to go up spiritually is help others to go up, and you'll automatically go up. Because in life, you can't stand in one. You know, you're either going up or you're going down. And as long as we're going up, even if it's baby steps, you know, this is a, a kind of Chabad philosophy. Even if you're going up very little, aside from that very little being a good trend of going up, it also guarantees that you're not going down. Because mm-hmm. to stand at one level is not possible. So so I think, I think we have to always... Uh, strive, and this is my ins- what I get inspired the most is that we're always striving to go a little higher, a little higher, do a little more, um, and 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 learn from those around us, and find any opportunity to do good, to do chesed, to do kindness. It's really incredible. You know, I'll end off with this question. I, I see online you posting all these beautiful stories, and you've shared so much with us already. But is there one story that either happened to you, or you've heard or seen? that gives you chizik, gives you strength, that inspires you? So I had a, uh, a 50-year-old man that uh, called me up, he told me he wants to do a bris. And anytime someone that's older wants to do a bris, for me, that's, that's I, 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 I get emotional to this day. Like I've participated, I've witnessed hundreds of bris, but when someone at older age, you read, you know, when you read in the Torah about Avraham, of, you know, at age 99 doing a bris, okay, it sounds crazy, but it happened thousands of years ago, and you see with your own eyes someone who might not be 99, but he could be 60, 70, or even 15, the science to do a bris uh, in your office, you know, in our shul, it's something that blows. So this 50-year-old man told me he wants to do a bris. Okay, I called the mohel. The mohel came. We're in the middle of doing the bris. There's a knock on the door, and a 13-year-old boy by the name of Nikita is knocking on the door. He studies in my school. He just joined our school. And uh, he tells me, Rabbi, is it true that the mohel's here? I said, yes. He says, I'd like to do a bris today. I asked him, does your mother know? He says, yes, she's on, she's on her way. So I close the door, I tell uh, the Mohel, Reb Shaya, I tell him we have to hurry on Boris because we have to fit an, another bris before a shkia. Boris hears this, he's not too happy. <laughs> he's like, don't hurry, take your time. <laughs> There's no rush. They don't know that you have to, you know, a bris you have to do before sundown, right? right before yeah, shkia. Yeah, of course. So he didn't know that detail. So he's like, well, I was half joking. Um, anyway, 15 minutes before shkia, before sundown, uh, this boy comes into my office. And we begin the procedure. And I see he's scared. He's frightened and I told Nikita are you sure you want to do this you seem scared he's like yes I have to do it and he keeps on saying I have to do it and I'm like what do you mean you have to do it he called his mother I didn't tell him the mole's here he found me himself like okay and he's like shaking I walk out I tell the mother are you sure we should do he's scared he's like don't worry even when he goes to the dentist he's scared it's Hmm. normal long story short we do the bris after the bris procedure I'm talking to him as they're taking care of the medical aspect that needs to be done after and I'm like uh, tell me Nikita why did you do this I see you're scared right you're scared that I'm terrified what brought you in today and he tells me the following story so this summer I went to your camp your overnight camp he said in camp the head counselor offered who wants to get an aliyah by the Torah who wants to be called up to the Torah I said I want to but he said it's going to cost you I said I don't have money he said no it's not money you have to do a mitzvah if you take upon yourself a good mitzvah we'll call you to the Torah we'll make a blessing for your mother your grandmother I said great and Nikita says you know my counselor always told me it's important that I have to have a bris I have to have a Jewish name so I raised my hand I said I'm going to do a bris they said great and then before he finished I said I'm going to do it within three years why did I say three years? Because I'm terrified. I don't want to do a bris. But three years gives you enough time to calm down. Hmm. Great. But then the head counselor says, wait, we have a problem. What's the problem? The head counselor says, I live in Moscow. After camp is over, I'm going to go to Moscow. How, how do I make sure in three years, maybe you're not going to do it. I need a guarantor. So Nikita looks at his counselor, a boy by the name of Shalom, an 18-year-old boy that's a Baal Shuva. He himself came back to the fold, started keeping Torah, Shabbos, Kashros, started living a Jewish way of life and he brought his parents along with him and he's an amazing boy he was like a child to me he looks at him and he says this counselor of mine Shalom is going to be my guarantor when they heard that great they called him up for the Torah and that's the end of his story and he says now you understand why I did the bris today 
I said, why? I knew why. Because Shalom, this boy, this amazing boy, was killed in a tragic car accident a few weeks before this. And Nikita looks at him and he says, I couldn't wait three years. I, I wanted to wait three years. If, if not for my counselor passing away in such a tragic circumstance, I would have been here in three years' time. The last day, I promise, is when I would do it. But I know that Shalom's neshama is waiting for me. I know that Shalom is waiting up there. He's calling me out, reminding me. That's why the second I heard the mole came to town, I said, I'm going to come here and I'm going to do this mitzvah for Shalom. And I, I, I couldn't say anything. I was crying. I looked at this I looked at this boy, Nikita, 13-year-old boy. His father, um, you know, his family is, is, is non, non-observant. He doesn't, didn't know anything until he came to camp. And he's willing to have that tremendous self-sacrifice. Why? For so his counselors, Neshama, should have an aliyah, should rise up in heaven. When it comes time to naming, I fill a cup of wine. And I say the naming ceremony. What name do you want? What Jewish name? You do a bris, you get a Jewish name. What name? Vikara Shmo Bi Yisrael. And he looks at me and says, what do you think? Hmm. Shalom. He took his counselor's name on that special day in honor of his counselor that, that was with him for all those years, for a couple of years in camp. And I look at this boy and he's saying, what inspires me? This story, insp- Nikita inspires me. Today, Nikita is 16 years old. This summer, he was a counselor in my camp. This summer, he was influencing other children so that they should also learn what it means to be a Jew, like their grandparents, like their great-grandparents. And, and this is the circle that goes around. You know, you, you, you do something for someone else. You do something, an act of chesed. You teach someone Torah. It doesn't, you do something for someone else. You never know what impact that will have beyond that person. You know, you did, you did one thing and that affects another person and another in this chain. This is the chain that will bring Mashiach. When we, when we do something and they continue and continue, it's, it's, a, it's, it's this, you know, this effect that, that, that continues. So this is, this, Nikita inspires me. Shalom inspires me from up there, knowing the life and the sacrifice he had to live from life. Um, and there's countless other people like him. So, you know, you're saying, is there a story I heard or, or that I could share? I, I, I feel blessed that we're in a place that we don't need to hear stories from other people. It's, it's, we always listen to, right? But, but there's so much of local Yidin that are, that are, that are really, you know, it, it's, you know, one of, the, one of the fascinating, I just want to end with this, one of the fascinating questions I always ask in camp, I sit with the boys, like when we have a far brain, and I sit down and I ask them, what do you think who has it harder, your great-grandparents or you? Your great-grandparents lived at a time that it was, uh, you know, you weren't allowed to live a Jewish life. You weren't allowed to go to shul. Or if you went, you'd be fired from your job. You wouldn't be able to go to university, right? So there, that's how they lived. And we live today with full freedom. You know, the government gave us back synagogue buildings. Our synagogue was given back. Our, our school building was given back. Thank God, you know, the government is protecting the well-being, you know, of, of the communities for all these years. And I say, um, you know, what do you think is harder? And we discuss it, and then I say, like, think a second. If you were told today that you're not allowed to step foot in our synagogue, is that going to make you more likely to come to shul or not to come to shul? And everyone raises their hands to come to shul. And I said, if you were told today that you're not allowed to put on tefillin, are you going to put on tefillin or are you not going to put on I said, put on tefillin. So we have this deep discussion. How some, when things are difficult, when things are challenging, it's easier. You, you feel like, I need it. There's a void. I want to do it. And then when there's the freedoms that we have here today and everywhere, you sometimes feel like, ah, you know, I, I don't need to go to shul to feel Jewish. I don't need to die. I don't need to learn Torah to feel Jewish. I don't need to, you know, I'm Jewish. It's good. Come on, last name's Cohen. No, but, but, but in some ways, it's, 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 you know, these lessons that I see from these, from these amazing uh, individuals, it's a lesson for me that in our life here, you know, if, if they could have, Baruch Hashem, we don't have to do a bris at age 40. Baruch Hashem, we don't have to fight to get kosher meat. Or For us, it's a decision. I could go to five different restaurants, but you know what? It's a big debate between the, the Wall Street the, the grill <laughs> or, or the reserve cut. You know, I went to both on a shvach, you know, the, the steak. I bought the best one for one ninety nine, and they said it was a special for this. But you know, a shvach, it wasn't the best. What are you talking about? It's kosher meat, <laughs> which, which, which our ancestors could only wish to get access to what we have today. Our, our learning Torah, we don't have time to learn Torah in the sheer. And look at this. You have, you have podcasts. You have access to everything in the world. We were living at a time that everything's at our fingertips, and we could 
could choose between having an extra hour doing nothing, an Arishkeit or whatever, or spending a few minutes of, of inspiration of something meaningful, doing a mitzvah. And um, it gives a lot of food for thought. That's incredible. I, I really enjoyed this. So if someone wants to find you or maybe donate to your camps or the, the, the people of Rostov, where could they find you and where could they donate? They could find me by coming to Rostov. Okay. I, I, you know, when I used to live in Are Cal- you going to pay for the ticket? Because it's very hospitable. Uh, it's, you know, oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so a lot of I'm, listeners, a lot of listeners. I, I'm, so I'm Canadian, know. so I, uh, <laughs> you know, my, my, I haven't yet fully adapted all the, right, the right. but if I do invite, uh, I'll tell you like this. I, you know, when I live in California, I tell uh, people, always you know stop by if you're in the area and like every week i have friends call me yeah we're in california we'll come for shabbos i've been saying it for 14 years already if you're in the area stop by few have taken me up on the offer right and the truth is when people came to visit um those that did come for us it's such chizuk having people come you know if someone says hey i'm willing to support you or i could come visit you what would you want no question hands down come visit i know today coming to visit is unlikely um we're we're, we're we have a non-profit here in the states um we have a website jewishrostov.com and uh Anyone that would want to partner in something or uh, partner, you know, for me, something that really touched me was someone who partnered with us, not financially. When someone recently passed away in Rostov, I shared a story about that person's life. And someone in California that I don't know said, I'm, I'm saying Kaddish for this person. He had no children. No, re- I ordered Kaddish in Israel. Then I find out that in California, someone partnered with us. It's not, it's partnered is not about money. It's not about, give, it's about doing something for a year there. And this is what Jews are about. So yeah, you could give tzedakah. You could also say Kaddish for someone that has no one to say. And you could support in a different way. But uh, any, 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 any support is greatly appreciated. It goes a long way where we live. It really now, you know, now more than ever, that you didn't need to feel um, that we're all one, that we're together, and that uh, and that we take care. Well, Rostov Rabbi, you're very choroshal. <laughs> Thank you so much. And our next uh, next time we speak, I expect more than three words. Okay. You have to do some homework. Yes, I will. I will. Shkayach. Thank you so much for listening or watching to this week's episode. I mean, we're getting people from everywhere and anywhere. So if you have not yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, Living L'chaim, go ahead. If you listen on Apple or Spotify, don't be one of those people who just come in, listen, and then bounce. Go ahead and subscribe or rate us five stars. And, you know, why or rate us five stars. If your friends do not have internet or don't have a smartphone, then you could tell them to go ahead and look at our numbers. We have phone numbers, America, UK or Israel, toll free. Uh, Rates and I don't know what the classic things they say with uh, phones, but um, yeah, it's a regular phone number. I don't know how it works. You call up, you can listen to any Living L'Chaim show and um, thank God we're the biggest call in podcast jewish podcast in the world right now so thank you all for that and uh go ahead and spread our number to more people if you have not yet bought a ticket for the dream raffle go to thedreamraffle.com you could see a link in the show notes please use the code ll because you'll get a discount in tickets and obviously they're tracking it so the more love you give them first of all the more opportunity you will get to get a free apartment in israel and as well as helping support our show the drawing is pretty soon. It's December 31st. If you're listening to this after December 31st, I guess go ahead and, and see. Hopefully one of our Living L'chaim listeners won. But if you haven't yet bought a ticket, go ahead, buy a ticket. It goes to a great cause. And hopefully you could be the lucky winner of that beautiful, gorgeous apartment. Until next time, keep on being a nation full of inspiration. <sighs> Need to work on the catchphrase. L'chaim. Living L'chaim. <laughs>